Okay, so now we've come to the moment of truth. We've got our Foolscap Global Story Grid and we have our Story Grid spreadsheet. Now, how are we going to put these two things together to create our final Story Grid? This is actually the fun part. So the first thing you're going to do <clears throat> is get a, a, a really nice piece of graph paper. And right in the middle of the graph paper, you want to draw a line from left to right. And from that line, you want to put from 1 to 64 or however many scenes that you have. Because we're talking about the Silence of the Lambs, we'll go from 1 to 64. So each bar on that graph will represent a scene. Now, the upper part of the graph above the line connotes positive, and below that is negative. So the thing to remember about putting these two things together, the Fool's Cap page and your uh, spreadsheet, is that your Fool's Cap page is going to tell you about the major, major shifts in your story. It's going to tell you about your beginning hook, your middle build, and your ending payoff. So it's going to tell you exactly in, in what place in your story, which scene, these major shifts are happening. So to begin with, we're going to talk about the global story value of a serial killer thriller. And the global value is life and death. You remember when we did the spreadsheet, each scene had its own value at stake? Well, now we're, we're going to put those scene values aside, and we're going to talk about the global values. So the global values in the story grid are represented by a red line for the life value. There's life and there's death. And then in between death and life is something called unconsciousness. That's when you're in a coma or you're out of it. And lastly, there's the fate worse than death which is damnation. Damnation is when it would be a mercy to die because you're overwhelmed with guilt or something terrible has happened. So um, to track the global value, what you want to do is you want to start and go scene by scene through your story and plot it, literally plot it on the graph itself. So in scene one of The Silence of the Lambs, the life value is going to be high. So you're going to make a red dot right there that corresponds with the highest value of life in scene one. And then each and every scene that follows after that, you're going to make the same points on that graph based upon your belief of what's happening in the story. It doesn't have to be perfect. What's important is that you, the artist, are able to subjectively figure out is thing, are things closer to death now, or are they closer to life? Now, in the case of The Silence of the Lambs, let's just take a step back and think about the Fool's Cap page for a second. Remember how I said the Fool's Cap page will map out your global changes from opening hook, the middle build, to ending payoff? Well, here's where we're going to put them to use. So when you go through the Fool's Cap page, you'll discover that the major point of shift after the beginning hook occurs in about scene 12 of The Silence of the Lambs. And this is when Starling gets the job to go with Jack Crawford to West Virginia. A body has been found. Buffalo Bill has been known to kill again. So at that point, Starling has always been sort of the gopher for Jack Crawford, the errand runner. And now, because she's done such a nice job at the beginning of the story, He's actually taken her out of the, uh, the FBI program for trainees and taken him with her to fingerprint this body. That's a crucial shift. If you think about it, that's a pretty major thing for the head of the FBI to do. He's going to take some recruit and take her on a plane and have her do a very, very important fingerprinting job. That's a major shift. So that's a great shift, and that's a moment when the story moves away from the, the beginning niceties of the beginning, finding of clues and things of that sort, to, oh my gosh, Buffalo Bill is active again. What are we going to do? So that's the end of the beginning hook of The Silence of the Lambs. It's around scene 12, chapter 12. So at chapter 12, what I usually do is I would start with chapter 1, and I'd mark my life value. And then I'll go to chapter 12 and know that's going to be a major turning shift in the book. So I'll make a little X on, on my X-axis at, at chapter 12. 
Back to the fool's cap page, we also know that the end of the middle build is when Jack Crawford's wife dies. And we know that because that's a really very, very important moment where Thomas Harris is basically taking a woman who's been unconscious throughout the entire novel and now, just before the ending payoff, she dies. So this woman who's been sort of floating around in the ether throughout the entire novel as sort of a symbolic metaphor for everybody in the story has now died. So we know that is when Bella, Jack Crawford's wife, dies. So I make a little X there too. Now the reason why I made these two X's is because this is these are going to be the two crucial places where our two um, lines are gonna cross. Now we're gonna do the exact same thing for the internal value at stake. The blue line represents the internal content genre that Thomas Harris chose for his protagonist in The Silence of the Lambs. And the protagonist is Cleary Starling, of course. This is a wonderful character who makes a major worldview shift from the very beginning of the story to the very end. And the way we can track that shift is by looking at the way Clarice Starling views the world as it happens to her throughout the story. So, as I said, it's a worldview shift and it's a disillusionment plot, which means that at the beginning of the story, she believes the world to be a certain kind of way, and at the end, she discovers that that is not true. At the very beginning of the story, she has a blind belief in the institution of the FBI. She believes, like we all do on certain things when we're starting out, she believes that if she does the proper amount of work, if she works really hard and is thoughtful, she will slowly rise up the ladder of the FBI based upon merit. She believes in the meritocracy of the FBI. So that's a blind belief in a, in a social institution at the very beginning of the story. And because it's a blind belief, I believe it's negative. She has no proof at the very beginning of the story. In fact, her personal history, when you go back, would, would suggest that institutions aren't really that you know, terrific. Now, when she gets to scene number 12, when she gets the job to go on the plane to go to West Virginia to fingerprint the body, now she's now moving into the positive of the worldview, justified belief. The FBI has actually rewarded her for a, a job well done. So she gets on to, to go on the plane with Crawford, and as she's going, they go to West Virginia, and there's a moment there that's very beautiful and really smart by Thomas Harris. And you'll see on the, on, the, on the story grid itself, there's a little dip. I think it's around chapter or scene 14 or so. And that dip represents this. When Starling is with Crawford, they're with a group of men. She's the only woman around. She's the only cop around that, you know, isn't one of the good old boys. And Crawford turns to the sheriff and he says, can I speak to you privately? You know, there's a woman around completely disrespecting her. And he goes in and they have their ch chat. Two scenes later, they're back in Washington and Starling is really upset because she was completely disrespected. The FBI, maybe it's a good old boys club. Maybe women aren't really respected in this institution. Maybe there's a moment of doubt. And you'll see on the story grid, in that chapter, in that scene, it dips and you'll see the blue little dip. And that dip represents that moment of doubt. And she wisely confronts Crawford and says to him, you know, what you did back there, you know, not really cool. And he, you know what he does? <laughs> he apologizes. He apologizes. So it's wonderful setup for a later massive disappointment. <laughs> but in that moment, Crawford actually increases her belief in the system because he admitted that he had made a mistake and he was disrespecting her even though it was for a good cause. Okay, let's move forward. Starling interviews Lecter a couple more times and this is the moment where she feels, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go the full nine yards on this relationship. I'm gonna let this guy have some of my childhood memories because if I do, I'm definitely gonna become an FBI agent. So she makes a deal with Lecter and it's his prid quote, Pro quo deal. And he says to her, I'll help you out, Clarice. 
All you have to do is open up your psyche to me. Let me in that brain of yours. And she does it because she believes in the FBI. She believes that if she does this, she is going to become a big time agent. Guess what happens? Shortly thereafter, they take Lecter away. She's not allowed to talk to him anymore. And now she's got the serial killer psychologist swimming around in her brain for the rest of her life. Now that is the moment of doubt. Holy cow, what have I just done? And that's when you see that blue line start to move downward. And it moves further and further down. And she reaches the point where she says, I can either stay in this FBI program and become an agent for an institution that I have no faith in anymore, that has used me, or I can go and try and help somebody who is gonna get slaughtered. But if I do that, I have to do it by myself. And it's exactly at that moment when Bella dies. That's not a coincidence. Not a coincidence at all. It's literally the death of her naivete and the literal death of a character. Then, from that moment forward, she's reached the level of disillusionment, she's underneath the x-axis, and she will never be the same. So a lot of people would ask me, um, in terms of the story grid itself, especially with the silence and the lamps, oh, that's kind of interesting that those things crossed at that moment. Wow, what a coincidence. Well, the, the reality is it's not a coincidence. It's crucial to create the kind of masterpiece that Thomas Harris did, whether he knew oh, I'm going to do this in scene 12 or not, he created the moments where both of them intersected at the exact same moment. And that creates, you know, a, a level of catharsis in the reader, like, oh boy, oh, it's like you take a breath at the beginning, at the end of the beginning hook, because you're like, ooh, now the fun's really going to begin. Now she's on the plane and they're going and Buffalo Bill's killed somebody and things are going great for her. All of that comes together in a very specific moment. That is not a coincidence. And in fact, the editor's job, and the reason why you do the full scap page, I'm speaking as an editor now, and if you're a writer, you need to be an editor too. The reason why you do the full scap page, and the reason why you do the spreadsheet, and the reason why you plot all this stuff, is that then you can see what's really going on in emotional terms in your story. So the beauty of the story grid and the whole beauty of the editorial process is to break down the components of story in a way that can inspire us to make us do the work that we know that we can do by showing us the work of the masters. Now, did Thomas Harris graph all this stuff and do spreadsheets? Probably not. I would guess he, the last thing he did was this. But he did, really. Internally, he did all of this work himself. Whether or not it was the schemata that I do is really not the point. The point is, is that here's a guy who wrote a masterpiece, and I think he would want other people to be able to look at his work and say, oh, wow, I see how he did that. Wow, that's really masterful. It's like when somebody makes a beautiful cabinet, and you don't know, you know what kind of dovetailing they did on the, on the drawers until you actually open up the drawer and look, and, wow, that guy really did a great job on that dovetailing. And it's the same thing in storytelling. So the more we can learn from the masters, the better our own work will be.